Okay? All right, that's it for announcements. Let me go and pray. Ask the Lord to bless our time in the study of the Word. We're in Leviticus chapters 21 and 22 this evening. Let's go and pray. I just want to thank you for, oh Lord, your faithfulness. Lord, I just am so excited, Lord, of what you're doing in and through this fellowship, Lord. And uh, Lord, it's a good thing, Lord. And I just pray your anointing upon everything that we do. May we follow your lead, not get ahead of you, not get behind, too far behind. Lord, may we just uh, wait to hear your voice and that as you would speak that we would go out in steps of faith, Lord. So we just want to thank you for all the opportunities you've given us, Lord, through this time, Lord, just even increasing our bounds through the life and teaching us, helping us to learn. Uh, those of us like me that are a little bit slow to learn new things, Lord, helping us to learn how to do these new things with technology, Lord. Help us, I pray, uh, as we try to refine these things, to even expand them. But then, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you just build this house of worship with, uh, with people, Lord, not just through electronics and live stream, but with people, uh, because I, I believe that that's your desire, Lord, truly to be face-to-face -face and praying for one another and encouraging one another. So I pray, Lord, as we make these plans to fill up this place, Lord, that you would be in them and that you would uh, go before us, I pray. Now, I just ask, Lord, that you would now anoint the time in the Word. This is our mainstay, Lord, your Word. You are our mainstay. And so I pray that you would anoint our time together and that you would have a word of prophecy to each one of us this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, so we're going to open our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 21. We're going to begin reading right there at verse 1. And so last week we looked at a summary of the different laws. I don't even remember that. We looked at all these different laws, but with the context of the penalties of breaking those laws. Remember that? And so we actually, from two weeks ago, we began the summary of the laws in chapter 18 where there were the laws of sexual morality. Remember, we looked at all those different kind of laws and the prohibitions of these things that you ought not to do or that you, that you people were doing and they ought not to do. There's prohibitions put in there. That was in chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, last week, we looked at several more laws, moral and ceremonial laws, some of which were highlighted before in the Ten Commandments and others which were additional laws. Like, remember the one that was listed on how to take care of the poor? Remember that? That was actually written in the law of Moses, how to take care of the poor. Giving to the poor. It was actually written right there in the law of Moses. And as you recall, it involved not just receiving what people gave, but actually working. Remember that? Landowners were required to leave the extras in the fields for the poor to come and glean themselves to feed their families. And that was actually written in the law. Right there. And so we looked at all these laws, and they were listed in these previous chapters. But the context, remember last week, of assigning penalties to those laws, breaking those laws, was in chapter, chapter 20. And really, it kind of did kind of dovetail into that, right? And we noted last week, remember, it's one thing to know the law, but it's another thing to obey the law. You can take a course in the law, but if you don't obey a law, what's going to happen? You're probably going to get arrested, right? And so there needs to be penalties to break the law. Because really, without a penalty for breaking the law, the law is going to be broken. Think about it. If we had all these laws in the books, and we talked about this last week, but no penalties, what's going to happen? Lawlessness. Lawlessness, right? And so we looked at that. And so that's how we ended in chapter 20 last week. Now, chapters 21 and 22, there's kind of a flow to this. I know sometimes we read Leviticus and say, what on earth is this talking about? Well, there is a flow, and that's why you want to read through the whole of the text and then just start looking at the parts, right? Just like anything, when you write a paper, when you write some kind of course, right? There's the minute details, perhaps in one course, but then hopefully there's a flow, right, to the entire course over the, over the weeks. So there's a flow to this. So in chapters 21 and 22, the focus now goes back to the priests, the ones who interpret the law and enforce the law. They too, they need to follow the law, don't they, right? And would there be penalties if they break the law? Well, even more so, right? Because they are to follow the law really to a higher degree in that their very conduct, how they live, should go above and beyond the letter of the law. They should be the examples of right conduct. And that's what we're going to see in these chapters, 21 and 22. There's a different kind of conduct that is actually uh, expressed in, in uh, the law of the Levites, okay? And I kind of think of, of it like teachers, teachers in schools. Now, 
This is theoretical, right? Not maybe what we see today. It should be, right? But theoretically, right? Teachers in schools, they should be the examples, right? When you think about it. Not only should they be teaching our children good conduct, but they should be living with good conduct, right? Because they are the examples. They are the role models, if you will, to the younger generation. So when you have elementary school children coming into school, right? Hopefully the teachers are practicing good conduct, good etiquette. They're speaking with respect, right? Because they're the examples. And it's the same way with any position of authority when you think about it, right? The higher the position, the more authority. And the more authority, the more accountability. It's because of the position of leadership. Not only in the church, not only in the schools, but in any type of institution, right? The leadership, they have more responsibility. Leadership comes with responsibility, which is the setting of the example. And, you know, I think about the family. Same thing, right? The institution of the family. The family, there's a chain of authority. What's that? Christ, the husband, the wife, and then the children. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 verse 13 says this. Paul said this. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And you can look in other scriptures and then you have the children, right? And so these are the examples, these Levitical priests, right? They're really the ones with the authority. There's God and then there's them, the high priests, we're going to talk about this evening. And so these high priests, they set the example, not only in of the law, but how they even conduct themselves, even above and beyond the law. And so remember that scripture, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, to of him they will ask the more. Now who said that? It's Jesus who said that. Those are red letter words of Jesus. And so Jesus says, if you're in a place of authority, you need to take accountability for that place, that position. Because really, God is the one that sets people in authority. He says that elsewhere in scripture, right? It's God who puts governments together, people in authority, and you're accountable to that place that he's put you. And so this is a spiritual principle, I believe, underscored throughout the Bible. And I believe that you can observe this principle in our society today. That the one in position of authority is the example, whether good or bad. You can be a bad example as well. The leader is the one who sets the tone and the order and the example for others. You ever notice that? You can even look at that at athletic teams, right? You can see the example set off by the coach. As the coach leads, right, kind of that sets the example for players. And you can kind of see that. And such is the case here in our text this evening with Israel. The priests were the leaders, and so they are the examples. There were laws that they interpreted and enforced over the people, but they were called to a higher standard than even them, a higher standard of conduct. And so that's what we're going to read about this evening, okay? So verse 1, chapter 21 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to who? The priests. And these are the high priests, the sons of Aaron. And say to them, None shall defile himself from the dead among his people. Verse 2, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. Verse 3, also his virgin sister who is near, near to him, who has no, had no husband, for her he may defile himself. Verse 4, otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Now the chief man is talking about, they're the high priests, right? They're the ones that go into the tabernacle, and they go before the Lord, right? And this is really the highest position there in Israel. Now, I want to clarify it. When it says, speak to the priest, right? The qualifier, again, it's, it's not just any priest. It's not the Levitical priest in general. It's the sons of Aaron. These are the high priests, right? So these high rules of conduct described here are for the sons of Aaron. High accountability, right? Because it's a high position. These are the ones where the high priests who go before the Lord. These are not the general Levitical priests, right? And there's other subordinate positions. Remember, we're going to see this in the book of Numbers, ones that kind of pack up the tents, move the things, right, of the tabernacle. There's all these different positions, but these are the high priests. These are the ones that go right there into the Holy of Holies behind the veil, right? And so these ones have high accountability. These sons of Aaron, they weren't to take part, notice, in any 
officiating of funeral services. That's what this is talking about when it talks about not defiling them themselves uh, with the dead. They're not to officiate any funeral services. That's what it's really underscoring. Okay? Because the funeral service is about what? The dead. Except for who? Notice in verse 2. Except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. Also his virgin sister who is near to him. Now, the reason for this was because of defiling himself with the dead. Remember that? When you touch the dead or come even near something that's dead, right? You are unclean. And then you have to go through these rituals of, clean, of cleansing yourself until the evening. So these high priests, remember, they're presenting the offerings before the rest of the people on their behalf to the Lord. And so they weren't to be defiled ever. And so, therefore, he's telling them, exclude yourself from officiating aiding at a funeral, except for your immediate family. All right, that's what it's talking about here. Now, the emphasis, though, I want you to underscore is that what? The high priest has to be clean. Not just spiritually, but physically as well. Now, we know to this. That's the distinction between man, mankind, and all of the animal kingdom, right? You ever notice that your dog, at least my dogs that I've had, right? You ever notice that your dogs, if you never give them a bath, they're happy as a camper, right? But you notice people, now people that kind of are thinking correctly, right? Especially, even the people that maybe don't have homes, right? The first thing that they want, other than perhaps maybe a meal, is, is, is a bath. Ever wonder why? Because man is created in God's image. And God is holy. And so even though people may not know the one true living God, there's that innate thing that's built into them to want to be clean. Because they're created in the image of God. You don't find that in the animal kingdom. And so it's interesting here, the emphasis on this section here is not only the cleanliness of Israel, but the cleanliness of the high priest. It's to really another order here. And that's what we're going to read. Okay, now verse 5 says, They shall not make any bald place, bald, like bald, bald head, bald place on their heads. Nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. So I want you to notice the call to what? Holiness. They shall be holy to their God. Verse 6. Now, the prohibitions of bald place on their heads and the shaving of the edges of their beards and making cuttings in their flesh... These were things that the pagan priests were doing in the pagan worship of pagan gods. And so they were to be totally set apart from these things. Remember, this law is given to Israel, right? And so I don't want to see everybody, anybody putting this, pasting this out of context and say, hey, if you're, if you're shaving your head or something like that, that you're, you're going to be cut off from your people. That's totally taking things out of context, all right? But it's in here in the context of Israel. Why? Because he knows Israel is going to be led into the land and all the pagan nations around them are going to be practicing this. And as they're practicing this, this is their worship to the pagan gods. And what does God want to be? He wants to be what? Set apart. He wants a nation to be set apart. And so there are these strict rules. This is how you worship. This is how you don't worship. Don't get it mixed up. Okay? That's what he's saying. And so this whole cutting of the flesh and then shaving your, your head in different ways, this is what they would do to worship the pagan deity. So he says, stay away from this. So God is not against people that shave their head. Not against bald people. But in the context here, you understand what's going on, right? And he wants them to be not mixed up with the worship of these pagan deities when they get into the land. And so it's an interesting principle, however, to note how they were to be set apart. That's, that's really the crux of the matter, right? It's not whether it's the head shaved or anything. It's to be set apart. Don't look like them. Don't act like them. Don't worship like them. Stay away. Set apart from them. Try to evangelize them for sure, but stay set apart. That's the principle here. And so it's interesting to me, this principle, to know when you look at just even church history, throughout the whole history of the church, was the church supposed to be set apart? Absolutely. And so if you study church history, when did the church not, or start to not be set apart? Well, it was in 313 AD. It's known as what? The Imperial Church. 
You know, you had the apostolic church. The last apostle lived until about 100 A.D. or so. That's where they kind of estimate. That would be John. Then after that, you had the persecuted church from 100 to 313 A.D. But then after the persecuted, and you know, the persecuted church was the most rapidly growing church, even though they were being killed for their faith. It just goes to show when the church is persecuted, that's when they do well. That's when they get holy, and that's when they do well. But when the church gets fat, what happens? They get watered down. That happened in the imperial church. 313 AD, who came into power in Rome? Constantine, right? Remember Constantine, he Christianized the whole Roman Empire. Became the Holy Roman Empire. But how did he Christianize it? Well, he started to graft in. Remember all these people groups that he started to conquer? Especially in the East, the Eastern religions. And so he started to graft all them in into Rome. And then when he Christianized the Roman Empire, he grafted in all these, what? Pagan beliefs. The church no longer was set apart. And so you can kind of study church history, and this principle is true. Now, is the principle still true today? Are there a lot of things getting into the church that aren't biblical? Oh, you better believe it. Yeah, some of it is horrible. And so you can see this principle really to be set apart, even though this is specifically for Israel, okay? There's application, isn't there? There's application to the church, and there's application to today, all right? So you can see how important this is to be set apart. Why? Because God is holy. He's different from the other gods. And so when we worship the Lord, it should be set apart from how they do pagan worship. Okay? Now, verse 7. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. So notice the higher calling right here, right? For the priest, the high priest. The high calling and the conduct and even taking a wife. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband. Okay, so they couldn't marry somebody they fell in love with that was divorced. Now this is to Israel, okay? Because they were to conduct themselves to a greater level. To whom much is given, much is required. Okay, now verse 8. Therefore you shall consecrate him... For he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. So here it's stated one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for the call to higher conduct for these priests. Because he offers the bread of your God. He's the one that goes in the tabernacle and represents you. Therefore he shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. So notice the higher accountability, right? It's for this high priest. Now, verse 9. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire. Now, that sounds pretty, pretty serious, doesn't it? Pretty serious judgment. Can you imagine? High priest's daughter becomes a harlot. The judgment is to be burned to death. If the daughter of one of the high priests goes off her rocker and becomes a harlot, Burned to death. But you know, I was thinking about this. I think that, that, that strict judgment, it kind of deterred it. Now, I can't think of anybody that was a daughter of a high priest that, anybody? I was trying to think about this. I don't think any in scripture that there was a daughter of a high priest that became a harlot. So apparently that judgment worked, right? <laughs> deterred that from ever happening. I don't remember. So, but again, this underscores the high conduct for priests, right? To whom much is given, much will be required. And not only for the priest, notice, but for the family as well. Right? For this, in this case, the daughter. We're going to see it a little further along. It's not only the priest, but his family as well. There's a high calling. And I think that the principle, that can be applied here as well. Ones that are called into the ministry today. Now, again, this is specific for Israel, but can this be applied to us today? What about a minister today? You know, can a minister today, through his family, drop the ball? The ones that are living under his roof, his wife, his children? You see, I think this principle can be applied today. Even though this specific law is for Israel, for sure. And we're going to see, again, there's the high conduct, in call, the calling of high conduct 
in the priest, high priest family. But I believe it's the same for a minister today. Again, this is specific to Israel, but the principle is the same. It can be applied today. Remember, the um, anybody read like the uh, pastoral epistles lady, first, uh, first Timothy and then... Um, First and Second Timothy and, and Titus, those are known as the pastoral epistles. That's what Paul is doing. He's writing his younger protégés, basically how to be a pastor. It would be to Timothy, who pastors the church in where? Ephesus, and also to Titus, he pastors the church in Crete. And so in Titus chapter, um, chapter 1 and First Timothy chapter 3, what Paul highlights for them is the characters of a pastor or an elder. Remember that? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Remember that? It's a rhetorical question, right? It's, he can't. And so one of the characters of an elder or pastor in the church is what Paul is advising Timothy. When you look for leaders in the church, you need to look at their families. If they can't manage their own family, then... Perhaps they can't manage the family of God. And so that's the principle. Now that's under the new covenant teaching, but you can see where the application kind of rolls from the old to the new, right? This specifically, what we're reading in Leviticus, is specifically for the Levite priest, and thank the Lord for that, because I don't want to see anybody burned to death, right? But all that to say, the principle is the same, right? Not only to manage your own conduct, but your household's conduct. Now, this is those that are living within, under your roof. So children that become of age, right, that, that's something different. But the children that live under your roof, right, there's accountability for that as well. Now, verse 10. He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil has poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. Verse 11, nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother. Verse 12, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his, of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Now, in those days, to uncover the head or tear, to tear the clothes, those were expressions of horror, mourning type of thing. Remember when um, Jesus says, hey, <laughs> when Caiaphas was saying, hey, are you the uh, son of God? He said, hey, you said it right. What did he do? He was in horror. He tore his clothes, right? And he says, blasphemy. You heard it yourself. We don't need any more witnesses. He claims to be God. And that's what sentenced him to death. Remember that whole account there? And so we see this happening throughout Scripture. You know, they would tear their clothes. It's, a, it's an expression of horror. Mourning the dead even. Okay, so therefore, as referred to earlier in the chapter, the high priest was not to officiate over a funeral except for his immediate family. That's noted in verses 2 and 3. So this is really what this is addressing. Shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes, right? It's in horror, perhaps like doing uh, a funeral service or something like that. It's referring to that, right? He shouldn't be doing that, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, now verse 13. And he shall take a wife in, in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry. Okay, so he emphasizes this. If you're the high priest, of one of the sons of Aaron, that you need to marry a woman that is not divorced and she's a virgin, has not been with any other man. Okay, this is specifically for them, the high priest, for the nation of Israel during that time. A widow or divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot, these he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife, nor shall he profane his posterity among his people. For I, the Lord, sanctify him. So he's set apart, fully set apart, right? And so for Israel's high priests, which the sons of Aaron are, there was a higher conduct even in the woman that they would marry. Okay, verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying... Verse 70, speak to Aaron, saying, no man of your descendants in succeeding generations, so this is not only Aaron and his sons, but the sons' sons, right? All those that are the perpetual high priest through Aaron's, right, seed. The succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. So no man that has any defect, physically, we're going to see, right, can 
bring an offering before the Lord. Verse 18, for any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long. So any of one of Aaron's descendants that are born like this, they, they cannot bring an offering. Okay, A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye, eczema or scab or is a eunuch. Verse 21, no man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Okay, what is he not to do? To offer the bread of his God. Go into the tabernacle, represent the people before the Lord, and then the Lord before the people. Right? It's specific to this. Verse 22, he, sh he may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. So he can partake, but he can't be the one that is actually officiating and serving. Okay? Only, verse 23, he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar. This is what he's prohibited to do. Okay? Because he has a defect, lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. Verse 24, and Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to the children of Israel. Now, these last verses that we just read, they underscore God's standard for those who come before the Lord in service as high priests, who, what, may approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 17, I want you to note that, okay? This had nothing to do with any biasness toward the disabled. Nothing to do. Furthest thing from the truth. But it had everything to do with God's holiness. Okay? And when you think about it, God's holiness, we're all a little bit unable, huh? We're not able to approach God's holiness. Right? But this was for a specific service as high priest before the Lord. Okay? To approach God, and we can't do that, right? The high priest can't do that because of sin. And so we all need, really, when you think about it, all of us are unable to approach the Lord unless there's atonement for sin. And so, really, this shouldn't surprise any of us, but there's a degree of representing the Lord right there in the holiness of God behind the veil in the tabernacle. And so, for that, there can't be any kind of disability like that, right? Any kind of... Um, less than, right, F perfect physical health. But the crux of the matter is really God's holiness. That's really what he's underscored. And approaching God on behalf of the people requires a physical wholeness as well as spiritual. And thus even these physical requirements is of a high priest. Verse 21, no man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. David Guzik, he makes this comment that every animal brought for sacrifice to the Lord had to be, what, without blemish. Notice that? But here we see that the priest who offered the sacrifice also had to be without blemish, without defect. And so we see this principle, right? Kind of running through, the sacrifice had to be perfect and the one that brought the sacrifice had to be perfect. Yet the perfection in both the sacrifice, Guzik writes, and the priest was not true perfection. Who's the true perfection? It points to Jesus, right? That points to Jesus. You see, true perfection came in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, the combination of the perfect offering and the perfect offerer of the offering was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was the perfect offering, and he was the one that perfectly offered himself, right? Isn't that interesting? 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was the perfect sacrifice. But the perfect offer of the sacrifice, the writer of Hebrews wrote this, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, 
and has become higher than the heavens. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. He's describing who? The greater high priest, right? Jesus Christ. And so this all points to Jesus because even the high priest, Aaron and his descendants, as perfected as they would try to be, they were not perfect. And so it pointed to what? Jesus Christ, okay? Very important for us to, to remember in the context of Scripture, okay? Chapter 22. Okay, so now from the holiness of the offers, or the high priests, to the holiness of the offerings. Chapter 22, verse 1. Right, these are the offerings. Verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. So what they bring to me, that needs to be holy. So I want you to notice that. What they dedicate to me, that is the offerings. I am the Lord. Verse 3, Say to them, Whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. So I want you to notice this, that the offering must be made after the uncleanliness of the offer was cleansed. Okay, I want you to notice that. The offering is made after the priest is clean. That's why he has to clean himself, right? And then bring the offering. Therefore, if a person had leprosy, that leprosy must be healed first, that is cleansed, right? And then the offerings brought to the priest for that leprosy. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Now, remember, remember when Jesus healed the 10 lepers recorded in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19? We refer to that just a handful of chapters ago in Leviticus. Remember the whole... Two chapters on the cleansing of a leper, we never saw until Jesus. Well, he cleansed these ten lepers. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now, when those lepers called out to Jesus for healing, Jesus said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Remember that? Now, the interesting thing about that healing was it happened as they went to the priests. Therefore, it was really a test of their faith. You see, while still leprous, they were instructed to make their way to the priest to offer the sacrifices of their healing, specifically the sacrifices highlighted in Leviticus um, some chapters ago when we read, a few weeks ago. But they were healed as they went, notice. But regarding our passage here this evening, the point is that the cleansing is to be done first and then the offering brought. Remember he says, go to the priest and show yourself so that they can make the offering. But they were still what? Leprous when they left. But that was their act of faith. As they went, they were cleansed. And then before they got to the priest, they were clean. Amen. And then the offerings came. So you see how the word of God, it just fits perfectly together here? Jesus, he practiced the law of Moses. But he added that little tidbit of faith. You go... You're leprous, you walk to that priest because you're going to be healed. So they had to what? In faith, walk, believing for the healing. How many came back to thank him? One. One. Was he a Jew? No, he was a Samaritan. And what did Jesus say? Didn't I, did, wasn't there ten healings? You know, I read that and boy, but it speaks to me, right? It should speak to all of us. After all that the Lord has done for us, where are we sometimes, huh? Missing in action. After all that Jesus has done for us. You know, it speaks to me. So often, right, when we're in need, but we're crying out to the Lord, but when He answers that need, we go about our business, huh? Verse 4. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or has a discharge shall not eat the holy thing or the holy offerings until what? He is clean. You understand? Notice, until he is clean. And whoever touches anything made unclean by corpse or man who has had an emission of semen, verse 5, or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, 
Verse 6, the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. That is, he must be made clean first, notice, right? Which is done by washing and waiting essentially a day until evening before bringing the offering, right? But remember, this all speaks to what? The bigger picture, the holiness of God. And that when God is approached, one must be physically clean and then the offering brought to make atonement. And so the priests, this is what they do, right? They wash, right? And then they bring an offering for their own sin so that they now can what? Bring in, remember those two goats? They slay one, right? For the sins of Israel. Day of atonement. Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16. We just studied that, right? But they have to go in with the blood of a bull first. They have to do all this washing and cleansing and they go in the blood of the bull first to atone for their own sins so that they're clean to bring the offering for the sins of Israel. So the clean, the cleanliness has to be before the offering comes. Okay? Now verse 7. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, this is after he's been uh, uh, unclean and he's made clean, right? A day when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, he may eat the holy offerings because it is his food. Whatever he dies naturally or is torn, by beasts he shall not eat to defile himself with it. I am the Lord. Verse 9. They shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby. If they profane it, I, the Lord, sanctify them. Verse 10. No outsider shall eat the holy offering. One who dwells with a priest or a hired servant shall not eat the holy thing. Verse 11. But if the priest buys a person with his money, he may eat it. And one who is born in his house may eat his food. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat of the holy things, of the holy offerings, excuse me. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child and has returned to her father's house, as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. So only the priest, this is what he's highlighting, only the priest and those under his roof, his household, can eat the offering. Right? This is for the high priest. Right? Remember, they received the offering and they partake of it. But it's only him and his family that are living under his roof, okay? That's what this is describing here. Now, verse 14. And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, oh, made a mistake, opened the wrong Tupperware, right? I ate the priest thing. What's it going to do? <laughs> Ever do that, Marvin? Ate something that wasn't yours? I do that all the time, right? So they have to pay restitution, 20%, right? And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. That would be 20%, right? So 20% restitution. So if you accidentally ate, I don't know, <clears throat> ate your Tommy, your friend, your whatever, your burger or whatever, right? I'm just giving an example, right? You have to pay 20% in addition. They have to replace it with 20% more of that which you ate. Okay, now verse 15. <clears throat> I was going to say Tommy Burgers. I don't know why I would say that, but verse 15. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord. Verse 16. Or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings. For I, the Lord, sanctify them. Verse 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 18, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel and say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his freewill offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, verse 19, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer. So notice again, the emphasis is now on the offering, right? Has to be what? Set apart. Anything with a defect shouldn't be offered, right? For it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. Now this once again underscores the holiness of God, right? And so there needs to be a set apartness of the person bringing the offerings, the priest, and a set apartness of the offerings themselves without what? Defect, right? So you get the picture here, right? When you approach God, it's serious business, huh? Now, what about now? When we approach God, is it serious business? It should be. It should be. It should be. What has changed? What has changed? 
The only thing that's changed is the cross. Now, it's a big change. But God is serious business. The only thing that's changed is the cross of Calvary. It's a big change. But think about it. Without the cross of Calvary, can you approach God like we do now? There'd be some problems. You know, when we read the Old Testament like this, it should give us an education on how we approach God today. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ for, for certain, right? But we need not take for granted the cost to do that. We approach God so much in a nonchalant way today because we forget the price of the, call, of the cross, the price of His blood. But you take that away, this is how they had to approach it, God. To all these sacrifices, time and time again, right? So it underscores the holiness of the offering that is without defect. And you know, again, this pertains to Israel, doesn't it? But again, the application can be, I think, applied to us as well. What are we offering the Lord? Are we offering our first and our best? Or are we offering our last and our worst? It's a good question, huh? For them, it was without blemish, the best. For us? You know, when we make an offering, is it simply what we have left in our pockets? Or is it our first fruits? Now, I want to, mark, I want to qualify that, right? We need to remember that God loves a cheerful giver. We're under a new dispensation, all right? But the principle, the application, still can be applied to our day. It's important to understand that God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And making an offering grudgingly is not really an offering, according to Paul. If you make an offering and say, oh man, I, I just... What Paul says is that God doesn't love that. He loves a cheerful giver. When you think about it, it makes sense, right? God, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, doesn't he? And so when you think about it in that perspective, God really doesn't need your offering, does he? I mean, he owns everything. You think if you give God a hundred dollars, he needs it? What about a thousand dollars? What about a million dollars? Now, I need it, but God doesn't need it. Does he? I don't think he needs it. You see, he doesn't really need your money, does he? He'll do sovereignly his will and his way with or without your offering of time and money. He'll do it anyway. But why should we do and apply this to our offerings? Well, you know, it's a matter of our hearts, isn't it? Your heart, my heart. And I think we need to give because it molds and shapes our own hearts. That's why we give. God doesn't need our giving. But when we give, it molds and shapes our hearts. Not to be so much more focused on ourselves. And more focused on who? On God and the Lord, right? And that is where the cheerful giving comes into play. That's what Paul is describing. You know, when we learn to give to God cheerfully, we come out from under the bondage of self. And you know, self is a powerful thing to be in bondage to. <laughs> but when we give freely, and we learn to give freely, we're freed up in the liberty of the Spirit of God. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But I tell you, where the Spirit of self is, a lot of bondage so there's a lot of application for us in this as well that we shouldn't be bringing our defects to the Lord you know we shouldn't be dropping off our used furniture that nobody wants on the church doorsteps and letting the church get rid of it why would you do that if anything give to the Lord your best 
How the application for us, right? This is a word to Israel. But the application we can apply to us, right? Verse 21, And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a freewill offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be what? Perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. So notice, give what is perfect. That is, give what is your best to the Lord. Verse 22, those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor, shall, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Verse 23, either a bull or a lamb that has any limb, too long or too short, you may offer as a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Verse 24, you shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land. Verse 25, nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 27, when a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. Whether it is a cow or you, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. On the same day, it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. Verse 31, therefore you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. Verse 32, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Therefore, there's a witness notice of who the Lord is by what you offer. I mean, think about this, right? Israel's a witness by what they offer. The priests, they're set apart. They're witnessed by what? By their lives eh? and how they handle these offerings. Okay, so it's an important principle, I think, that we can apply to us as well. This is for Israel, but it can be applied to us. What we bring as offerings to the Lord is a witness of who the Lord is to us. Think about it. It makes sense, right? What I offer to the Lord with my life here in this fellowship, it's a witness of who the Lord is to me, isn't it? If I don't have time for the Lord, then my witness for the Lord is not so good, right? If I don't have resources for the Lord, what kind of witness is that? Now, I'm not being legalistic here, right? But it, it makes sense, right? It's been said that you can know a person's heart by looking at their paycheck. Or their, their checkbook, excuse me. Do you think that's true? Yes. doesn't say that in Scripture, but it alludes to it. Now, I'm not sure that that's 100% true, but I think it does have some truth to it. You can know a person's heart by opening up their checkbook. The Scripture that's pointed to when I hear people say this is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, when Jesus said this, For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Huh? You see, if you want to know your own heart, don't, don't point the finger, right? Let's look at all of our own hearts. If you want to know your own heart, evaluate where your treasure is. That is, look at where you spend your time and your money. So let me read this entire passage that Jesus taught on this topic so you can get the context. This is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Isn't that good? 
And so there's a clear connection, I believe, between where your treasure is and where your heart is. Therefore, we need to be what? Laying up our treasures, not in this life, but in heaven. In things that will not perish in this life. And the way we can know if our heart is right is by what we offer the Lord. It is... All right, let me just reverse this with a question. Is it our best and first that we offer to the Lord? Or our worst and our last? It's a good question, right? Kind of hits, hits you right here. Remembering this, though, that God loves a cheerful giver. Let me close with reading you that in its context. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6, 7, and 8, if you're taking notes. It says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. You see, what Paul is really underscoring is that if you can't give cheerfully, don't give. God doesn't need it. See, it's for you that you give, not for him. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. See, the principle is this. If you can give cheerfully, God loves that. And he's going he's gonna to take care of you. That's the principle. If you can give cheerfully. But if you can't give cheerfully... Maybe just uh, pray about it. Now this is what I say in practical terms. You know, I believe, and you've heard me say this, that everybody ought to give something. Something of their time and something of their resources. And so, it has to be done cheerfully, willingly. And so, if you're at a place where you kind of are going across that line and it's grudging, and then just back it down. Like, so let's say, you know, you tried giving like, I don't know, a couple hours a week serving. And maybe, uh, I don't know, $50 a week. And you say, oh man, that's just it's too much. I would just say bump it down. Do it one hour. Give 30 bucks. That's too much? Bump it down. Maybe just come and set up chairs. Take about, I don't know, 30 minutes. Give $10. Back it down to where you can do it with the right heart. But I got to tell you, I think everybody can give maybe $10, huh? How much does a Big Mac meal cost now? $10? I mean, think about it, right? We, we can spend on that pretty easily. It's between you and the Lord, though. Don't tell me about it. It's between you and the Lord. But I got to tell you, you know, as we exercise and we actually develop in that gift, you're going to be free from self. And when you're free from self, boy, the sky's in limit from the Lord. It's for your benefit, really. Not for the Lord's, because like I said, he doesn't need ten bucks. He doesn't need a million bucks. He's got what he needs. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us, I pray, Lord, to understand these scriptures in its context and help us to apply it to our lives today, rightly, Lord, accurately. But we would like to have it applied to our lives Lord, because there's so much principle, so many principles here that really do speak to our hearts. Lord, help us, I pray, to discern and to understand and to really know your heart, Lord, in a, every situation that comes up in our life. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? For thou, O Lord,